Istanbul. How are you doing? Yeah? A bit louder, maybe? How are you doing? Cool. So, um, hi. My name is Jonas. Jonas Pils. I work for Maxon uh, in the marketing department. I'm one of the product specialists. And today, I want to talk about MoGraph. But first of all, I want to ask you, who of you... Well, actually, the question might be... Well, not very appropriate here, but who uses Cinema 4D? <laughs> who doesn't use Cinema 4D? Okay, there are also a few. Okay, then let's start. Cinema 4D, for those who don't use it. So for me, it's the outstanding 3D software, and this is because of so many things. So Cinema 4D is a 3D all-rounder package. So what you can do with it is modeling, texturing and shading, animation, lighting, rendering, everything that you need to do inside of Cinema 4D. And of course, as the last point, motion graphics. And that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, there are various ways to create motion graphics, but one very special way is to use, well, a so-called tool set inside of Cinema 4D that, well, is called MoGraph. So, what is MoGraph? Actually, it's that tool, especially when it comes to generating and controlling object clones. So, whenever you have a huge amount of objects inside of your scene, MoGraph is the way to go. All right, where can we use MoGraph? In motion graphics, of course, and this is actually a project done by Matthias, who is also here and is also a speaker later. Um, could you wave, Matthias? Where are you? Here is Matthias. He's the motion graphics guy who does this stuff. All right, but you can also use it in visual effects, for example. If you see all of this fracturing stuff going on here, that is also MoGraph, uh, particularly the Voronoi fracturing. Repetitive structures, of course, if you have a tool set that is specialized in cloning stuff, you can create repetitive patterns. And this was actually meant to be the front of the car, but whenever you give that to some creative guy, something like this comes out. And the last thing is rigging. You can also use it for rigging, which is incredible. So what you see here is a street following one spline path. And whenever you want to adjust the shape of the street, you just have to adjust the points of the spline and the whole street uh, plus the animation will follow that spline. I cr uh, once I created one of these rigs myself uh, for my last job um, yeah, in industrial visualization and it was quite cool because I knew the customer and the customer comes, comes always in the very end of the project and says, hey, I don't like the shape of the street and if you don't rig your stuff, you are in trouble <laughs> because then you have to redo everything from scratch, you know? All right, the MoGraph basics for those who don't use or who haven't used MoGraph yet. There are the green objects, which are the generators. Those are the objects that you can create MoGraph clones with. So. Here you can create the many objects. Then we've got the effectors, and the effectors, well, are the objects that you can use to control the object clones that you created by using the generators. And then in the end, we've got the fields, and the fields are like a waiting system all over Cinema 4D, which is quite cool. And with fields, you can mask the effect of effectors, you know? All right, so here in the middle, we see a cloner. If we add an object, any object, you will create many clones. If you want to randomize the whole stuff, add a random effector, and then you see that the whole stuff is randomized. And if you want to mask the randomness, you add a field, and then, for example, you have um, no randomness in the lower left and randomness in the top right. All right, that's the theoretical part, so now, we get more practical. I want to create some projects. I'm not sure if we can create all of that, or all of them, but um, yeah, here's the stuff I want to create with you. 
live inside of Cinema 4D. So here we've got a countdown with some dynamic simulation. Then next, we've got some very, well, abstract animation. Next, we want to create something like this and play around with some volumes. And if we then have time, I will introduce you to fracturing and show you how you can create something like that. I have to admit that I really think that we don't have time for this one, but if we have, it's quite cool. And um, I hurry up so we can create as many things as possible. So let's jump into Cinema 4D. Did you enjoy yourself so far? Great. All right, let's start with the countdown. So what do we have here? We have a scene which has like three objects in it, a sphere, a cube, and a platonic, with different materials on them, and they are in the shape of a five, then all of the objects fall down to be sucked up again and, well, be in the shape of the next number. All right, let's do this. Let's jump into Cinema 4D, and here we go. This is the starting scene. So what we have here is a simple scene with the objects and materials here. So can you see that well, or shall we try to dim the, the front row of lights? Let's dim it. So if there's the possibility to dim the lights, please do so. All right. So the first thing we need to create is a cloner. The cloner can be found here. So with release 21, we adjusted the interface a bit because we just have one version left. There's just a Cinema 4D, not studio, broadcast, visualize, and so on anymore. So now we've got a MoGraph menu here, and here you see the cloner. Let's create one, and let's select all of the other objects and make them a child object of the cloner. So now the objects are cloned. Here you can see this is what the cloner does with them. For those of you who don't know MoGraph yet, here you can adjust the amount of clones, for example, and the shape, and so on. So what we want to do is we want to clone these objects onto the numbers. Therefore, we need the numbers. All right, maybe let's make the cloner invisible, and let's create a spline shape, which should be the text, text spline. All right, this is the text spline. We want to align it in the middle. So now we have the text spline here in the middle. Can you see this? Yes. All right, and now let's adjust the text here. So we'll start with the five, and at frame zero, we will create a keyframe by hitting this button here. Then we go to frame 50, type in four, and set another keyframe. And now this will be a little bit repetitive. Let's go to frame 100. The text should be three, set a keyframe. Let's go to frame 150. The text should be two, and set a keyframe. And so on and so forth until we reach frame 250 and set the text to be zero and set another keyframe. Now, if we hit play, you see that the number is counting down. Okay. Right, now let's add an extrude for this shape here. The extrude is now here. So we also reordered the generators here. So what we have here is now um, the mesh generators. And what we have here in that menu is the spline generator. So these need a spline as the basis. Okay, let's add the extrude and I'll hold down Alt to create it as a parent object of the text. And here we go. Now if we scrub the timeline, you see what's going on. All right, we will make it, well, very, very thin. So let's say one. 
Okay, this is the shape we want to clone on. Therefore, let's make the cloner visible again and let's select it to see what we can do here. So there is a parameter called mode and we can set this to object. And with the clone mode set to object, we need an object that, well, needs to be linked into this field here. So let's use the extrude. Let's drag and drop it into the object field here. And now you can already see that the clones are cloned onto that shape. All right, first let's bring up the count of clones maybe to 100. Here we go. And now we can already make the extruded numbers invisible. So let's scrub through the timeline and now we have got this. Okay. That's not good enough. So let's make some adjustments. First of all, I want to add some randomization. I want to randomize the size as well as the rotation. And therefore, we need a cloner. Uh, we already have the cloner. We need a random effector, sorry. So let's select the cloner here. And let's open the MoGraph menu here and add a random effector. And with the random effector applied, you see that the whole thing, well, kind of explodes. And this is because by default, the positions are randomized. So let's go to the parameter tab of the random effector. Let's deactivate position. And instead, let's activate scale. We also activate uniform scale. And let's set it to some value like 0. 0.3. And let's also randomize the rotation. Let's say 90 by 90 by 90. And now we've got some randomization going on here. Okay, let's move the whole number up a bit because now we want to add some dynamic simulation. And therefore I want to create a floor object. Here we've got the floor object and I want to add dynamic simulation. So how can we do this? With a tag, of course, because tags enhance the um, functionality of an object. And we want to enhance the functionality of the cloner to be, well, dynamic. Okay, therefore, let's select the cloner and let's right click and go down, go down to simulation tags, rigid body. So rigid bodies are just bodies or shapes that won't deform themselves. There are also soft bodies, which will deform themselves, but rigid bodies don't do that. And then let's go to the floor object, right click and go to simulation tags, collider body. So if you didn't know, if we delete the tags again and select the cloner as well as the floor, we can right click, go to simulation tags and add a rigid body and it will create a collider tag automatically for the floor object. Isn't that cool? All right, so now we have got dynamic simulation. Let's see how that works. We press play and here we go. All right. So you see what the problem is. The number is there in the beginning, but then it starts exploding and won't be sucked up. Therefore, we have to do some adjustments. The reason for the explosion is that in the initial state, um, the geometry intersects and the dynamics algorithm wants to avoid intersections and it pushes the objects apart and that's where the explosion comes from. All right, so first of all, maybe let's select the objects and let's scale them down just a bit and then Let's add another, or let's in, let me introduce you to another parameter in the dynamics tag, in the force tab, which is called follow position. So follow position is a parameter that will keep all of the MoGraph objects dynamic, but also tries to keep them in their initial position as good as it can. So if we bring that up to one, you see, that something like this happens. So it explodes, but all of the clones come back together somehow. But as you can see here, the follow position is not strong enough. Let's bring it up to 10. 
And let's also bring up the follow rotation to 10. All right, so now we see that this is already a pretty cool effect. Maybe let me scale down the objects again a bit. Something like that, all right. So do you like the effect so far? It's cool, isn't it? All right, so the next thing we need to do is to make them fall down or to make the objects fall down and then being sub, uh, sucked up again. And this can be done by animating the follow position parameter. So let's go to the dynamics tag here. And maybe let's go to frame 20, wow. That never happened before. I stopped the animation, oh sorry. I really stopped the animation exactly at frame 20. Lucky me. Yeah, <laughs> thanks Matthias. All right, let's set two keyframes, one for follow position and one for follow rotation. And at frame 21, I want to set it to zero, or both to zero, so they fall down. So what we have in the beginning now is the five, and then at frame 20, all of that, all of the objects will fall down. So now they need to be sucked up again. How can we do this? Of course, by animating it back to 10. So let's go to frame 50. Let's set the two keyframes here. Then let's go to frame 60 and animate it up to 10 again. All right, let's hit play. And here we see it falls down and then whoop, four. Cool, right? Good. So what we need next is keyframes for all of the other numbers as well. And therefore, I can just select the keyframes here in the power slider, hold down command, and move them over to the other numbers. Just like that. And here we go. It works, but you see that the numbers are, are there for a very short amount of time, so we need, uh, we need to retime the whole thing. Therefore, I will bring up the timeline from window, timeline, dope sheet, and I will select a few keyframes here and just move them uh, 10 frames to the, to the back. And let's press play again. Yeah, now we can see it. So normally this is the time where people clap. <laughs> Thank you. No, but seriously, do you like the setup? Great. Let's move on. Right, this one. Do you have an idea how to create that? Tracer. The tracer? That's, a, that's an interesting approach. Maybe, maybe that would work. So, the way I created it was, I created a, a base object which deforms and then I cloned other objects onto the edges of the first object. That's the whole thing. So let's jump to Cinema 4D and let's create a new scene. So we will create that from scratch. And first, let's create a platonic. And the platonic is the base for the, for the moving shape. So one thing you can do, which is very powerful, is, yeah, to displace the whole thing, but with a special technique. I don't know if you knew it, also the MoGraph guys um, of you. You can use MoGraph effectors as deformers. Did you know that? Who knew that? Wow. Okay. If you want to do that, you need to go, for example, to the random effector, make it a child of the platonic because Every deformer has to be 
a child of the object that it should deform. Normally, there are other cases where you can do it in another way. And then you go to the deformer tab and adjust the deformation parameter to be point. And here you can see, wow, it deformed. So let's hit animate and you see nothing happens. Why is that? Because the random mode is set to random. And what random does is it will create some randomness in the beginning, but this randomness will stay as is. So this is not animated. All right, if we adjust that, for example, to be noise, you see that the shape animates. Maybe let's get rid of the font tag here. All right, that looks quite good. Um, let me bring down the animation speed. Let's set it to 20% and let's also set the scale to 20% and maybe also let's check indexed. And now I want to make the effect a bit stronger and maybe you know that, but what you can do inside of Cinema 4D is you can bring up parameters to more than the sliders might suggest. So we can bring this up to maybe 500 and then we've got a shape like this. Okay, and this is gonna be the base shape for the objects, for the cylindrical objects that we will um, clone onto the edges here. All right, so now let's make the platonic invisible and let's create a cylinder. Maybe let's go back to the animation here. And what you see here is that these objects, here you can see it, um, they are somehow cylindrical, but they are also um, concave. And this was done by using a deformer. So first of all, let's set up the cylinder to have a radius of, let's say three, and a height of 100 centimeters. And the height segments need to be higher because of the deformation that we want to add. Let's bring it up to 10. And we also want to add some caps. Um, well, not the caps, the fillets, of course. And now the whole thing looks like that. Not too spectacular at the moment, but we can add another deformer, which should be the bulge deformer. I hold down shift as I create it, and this way it will create it as a child. And then I will, well, bring down the strength to maybe let's say minus 80. And here we go. This is the shape we want to clone onto the other shape. All right, therefore, you know what to do. We need to add a cloner. Right, let's do that. Oh, that was two cloners, sorry for that. So now we cloned it and as in the other setup that I already showed you, we need to set the mode here from linear to object. We want to clone on an object and the object should be the platonic. So here we go. Let's make the platonic visible again to see what happens here. So the objects are somehow cloned onto the surface, which is actually not what we want. We want the clones to be cloned onto the edges of the object. And therefore, we adjust the distribution parameter here from surface to be edge, bam. Okay, seems to work, but we've got another challenge here, which is we need to adjust the length. So the length of the clone, uh, so that the length of the clone always fits the length of the edge. And there's another parameter that I want to activate first, scale on edge. And then I want to bring up the edge scale to 100%. And that's basically it. So now, if I animate the whole thing, maybe let's make the platonic invisible again. We've got this. And the cool thing is that it's completely procedural. So if I adjust the initial shape, the platonic, for example, if I bring up the count of segments, you see that it adjusts. Right? Nice. Good. Let's move on to the next. Did you like the setup? <laughs> Thank you. All right. So what do we have here? It's some kind of growth effect. 
and it also shows some remapped noise. And yeah, I want to show you how to create this. Um, who already created a growth effect by using fields? One person, two, come on, Matthias. Yeah, you did. Three people. All right, four. Not too much. Right, so let's just start. We start from scratch. And I will start by creating a plane. And the whole effect is created by using a vertex map. And if you don't know what a vertex map is, basically um, with a vertex map you can store a weight value on every single point of the geometry. That, uh, that is what a vertex map basically is. So let's bring up um, the mesh of the plane. Well, we could increase the subdivision. Let's make it 100 by 100. So we need a quite dense mesh here. And now we make the whole thing editable. So we have access to the points. All right, now let's select one point, for example, somewhere here. And let's create a vertex map. How can we create a vertex map? We can go to the select menu and go down to set vertex weight. Or, that's the way I prefer, we press the key V on the keyboard. And this will bring up this little global menu here, and then we go to select and set vertex weight. Who knew that? Also not too many. This will speed up your workflow a lot. All right, let's set the value to 100%, and now you see that we created a vertex map tag, which is this one, and you can also see that we stored weights on the points, and you can see that yellow means 100% weight, and red means 0% weight. And all of the, well, shades of orange, so to speak, um, represent a value between 0 and 100%. So now let's have a look at the vertex map tag. Uh, since release 20, there is a powerful checkbox, which is called Use Fields. And yeah, fields are our new unified weighting system all over Cinema 4D since release 20, and they are really powerful, actually one of my favorite um, new tools. And here we've got the freeze layer. The freeze layer just stores the weight map that was there when you created the freeze field. That's it, basically. But if we select the freeze field, you see that it comes with a few parameters, and one of these parameters is mode. It's set to none but you can also set it to grow. So let's do this. You see that the radius and the effect strength parameters are enabled now. So what does this mean? Um, whenever there is a weight in the vertex map here, the freeze field will have a look around this weighted point in a radius of 10 centimeters, and if there is another point on the geometry, it will weight it. And this will happen every single frame. So if I press play now, you see we've got a growing vertex map, which is really powerful because you can do a lot of stuff with vertex maps. And this technique, by the way, also um, works with uh, MoGraph, clones, and everything, really everything. It's a unified weighting system. Okay, so maybe let's increase the radius. This will also increase the, the speed of the effect. But this is where the effect strength here uh, comes into the game. Um, because with the effect strength, you can counter um, the speed here. So if you bring down the effect strength, you will reduce the speed. So here we go. That's already quite cool. One thing I don't like about this at the moment is that it's more or less a circular shape. I want it to be more organic, so I want to add some noise. Okay, how can we do this? Well, you see that here, right next to the freeze field, there is a small plus. And if we press this, you see that there is a folder which is called radius. And you can 
place fields underneath this folder, which means that the radius can be controlled by other fields. And this is where it gets really exciting, because now I will create a random field, which is a little bit small at the moment. We will bring up the noise to 400 percent of scale, and then let's make it a child of the radius here and press play and see what happens. Nothing happens. So, because we need to set the blending mode to normal? No, because the seed of the, of the noise wasn't the right one. Okay, so whenever a growth effect with the noise doesn't work, you might first uh, have a look uh, into the noise seed for troubleshooting. And now you see that this is quite organic. You see that it doesn't just grow from the inside to the outside, but also um, to the sides and so on. Another thing that you see is that there are quite sharp edges here in the middle. How can we smooth them is the question. Right, therefore we need another vertex map. So why would we smooth them at all? Let me show this to you uh, by using a displacer. Um, let me create a displacer. Let's make it a child of the plane. And if you don't know how the displacer works, um, it will displace the geometry based on a shader, which means that everything that is white will pop out and everything that is black will go inside and everything that is 50% gray will just leave uh, the surface as is. So let's just create a color shader here with a white color by default and you can see if I disable and enable the displacer that, that it moves and this is because of the displacer. And now we go to the displacer's fall off tab and just drag and drop the vertex map inside of here. And now if we hit play you see the growth effect. And you also see that the sharp edges are way too sharp for the displace effect. And this is why we need to smooth it. Okay, how can we do this? I already told you, by duplicating the vertex map here. And let's rename the first one to be one and the second one to be two. And now here's the interesting point. In the second one, we just delete everything that is inside. Because what we want to do is, we want to read the first vertex map and then blur it. So, inside of the second vertex map, we can drag and drop the first vertex map. Here we go. And if we hit play now, and select one vertex map and then the other one, you see that it's pretty much the same one it's not the same one because we have to deactivate use deform points, but now it's the same one. Okay? Right. So if we have the first one selected in the field list here, we can also see some modes here. Let me pause the playback and let's set the mode to average because average will blur out the vertex map by a radius of 100 centimeters by default. That is way too much, so let's bring this down to 15 centimeters and now we have got something like this. And now let's use the second vertex map in the displacer as the fall off. Let's get rid of the first one and now let's see what happens. Okay, that's way smoother. Thank you. Um, so what, we can, uh, what can we do with that? Um, actually, we wanted to create an effect like this. Now, come on, let's play the animation. Here we go. So how can we add this? Actually, everything we need to do for that effect is uh, we need to remap the noise. And we can do that inside of the fields. 
So let's go back to Cinema 4D and let's have a look at the first vertex map here. And then we've got the random field. Maybe let's actually select the random field and go to the remapping tab. And in the remapping tab, there is, I don't know why it's folded, but there is a very important set of parameters down here under contour. So what you can do here is you can remap, as the, as the tab says, you can remap the uh, whole effect of the noise. So what we can do here is we can set it to quad, uh, quadratic, to step, to quantize, but we can also set it to curve. And if we set it to curve, we have a spline interface here and we can custom create a remapping. So let's do this. Let's bring down the right side to zero and let's set another well, handle here in the middle and bring this up. Okay, now we have this here, which looks quite similar, but we will add some more detail here. So, first of all, we can we can adjust the spline range, uh, spline range here. And if you set this to 200%, for example, you see here that um, we've got two waves now. And if we set it to 400, for example, we've got four waves now. So this looks like this now. And if we also add some spline animation speed here, Let's um, bring it up to 50. We have some animation going on, which will, yeah, like animate the whole thing. Now, the reason for this whole thing being yellow, oh, sorry, being yellow in the end is that we still have the growth effect going on. So maybe let's, um, yeah, let's add some stuff to the second vertex map here. Because the first thing we did was we added the, um, the first vertex map for the growth effect. And now I want to add the random field here. It looks like this um, is looking like. It's also very cool. Nice. Never did that before. Um, and here in the second vertex map, let's set the random field here to multiply and now it should create a nice growth effect with um, the shape or with the animation that we just created. I mean, look like that. Uh, look at this. It's just beautiful. Okay, so how can we colorize this is the question now. So if you have a look at this animation, maybe I have to go back and then to this one, all right. You see that the things or the, the, the areas that come out have a special color. If you watch it twice and on a better screen, you will see that this is just a reflection. But we can also, um, yeah, just colorize the whole thing. Okay, therefore, let's go back to Cinema 4D. Maybe let's also make the noise a bit bigger. Maybe let's bring it up to 600% and see what it looks like. All right. And now I want to use this vertex map for shading. So how can I do this? With the vertex map shader, of course. So there are ways of bringing the vertex map to our new node-based material system, but I want to show it um, in the old material system because then we can um, see it live in the viewport. So let's create a new material. Come on, a new standard material. And let's assign it to the plane. And in the plane, or in the material, let's, oh, let's, bring, down, let's bring down the color to something like black and let's add some luminance here, 
And in the luminance, let's add a texture. And we go down to Effects, Vertex Map. Here we go. This is the shader where we can read the vertex map. Let's add this, and then we have to open it and link the vertex map into this. And now you can already see that the whole thing works. Okay, now we could colorize and remap the whole thing, um, but I will stop here because I want to show you some other setups. Um, yeah, I hope you liked it so far. Thank you very much. All right, next setup. This one. Let's play around with volumes. So what we see here is basically a meshed noise. And I want to show you how you can mesh noises. Who meshed a noise in the past already? Two people. Three, four, five. OK, five people. So the cool thing about volumes, or one of the cool things about volumes, there are actually much more, or many more. Let's create a new scene. Um, the cool thing about volumes is that you can mesh noises. And you can use that for landscaping, for example, but also for very nice motion graphics effects. So let's start by adding a random field. We will create a random field here. And we will bring up the scale of the, uh, of the randomness or of the noise to, let's say, 500%. So right now, you cannot see anything, but let's go to the view settings and enable the view here. So this is what the noise looks like. If you add a noise in a field, the noise is in the whole scene. It's not just here in the middle, it's in the entire scene, everywhere. And we can use the volumes that were added with release 20 to mesh these um, noises or the fields. So let's create a volume builder, this one here, and let's make the random field a child of the volume builder. And here you can already see what happens. Maybe let's also mesh it. This is the volume mesher here, and it needs to be applied as a, ch uh, as a parent object of the volume builder in this case. And now you can see that we already meshed the noise, which is already quite cool, but let me, let me make the noise a bit bigger again. Maybe let's bring it up to, let's say, 1000%, something like that is good. And let's also animate it. For example, let's add, well, 30% of animation speed and let's have a look at how it looks like. All right, you see some flickering at the edges, but you can get rid of that if you uh, increase the resolution of the volume. Here, for example, let's um, bring down the voxel size, and now you see that we've got less flickering, and we can also smooth it. I will do that in the next step. All right. Yeah, just let's do this. We smooth it, and here we go. Maybe let's decrease the voxel distance to one, and this is what it looks like now. So there is no flickering at the edges anymore. And now I want to add, or I want to create a copy of that whole setup. And in the second setup, I want to invert the noise, and then we've got two things, or two noises, which don't intersect, but are animated the same way. Now, of course, the, the viewport, um, the viewport uh, frames per second go down because Cinema 4D has to calculate a lot at the moment. All right, but it's already looking quite cool. If you want to add some materials, let's uh, create some physically-based materials and maybe a green one. Sorry. Here we go. We've got this. Okay, one thing we added in release 21, and you saw it in Fatih's presentation, 
um, is cache layers. Let me cache one of the two here. Let's go to the volume builder. Let's create a cache layer here. And let's cache the whole animation. Press cache, and then the whole thing will be calculated. Takes a while, but you know we have time. At least 10 minutes left to show two more setups. <laughs> okay, so now it should be a bit faster. Not extremely faster, because um, I still didn't cache the other one. But um, if we deactivate this, you see uh, real-time feedback here. So there are cool things that you can do with that. And you can see it here in this shot. That's basically the same technique, but with more layers. And the overall shape was restricted by another shape. But the technique behind the whole thing is just having a noise which is remapped and, yeah, animated. That's basically it. Okay, let's move on. Um, yeah, let's stay in Keynote. And I want to show you this. So I want to introduce you to fracturing. Who used fracturing already? Not too many people. Uh, have you used it in a motion graphics uh, context already? Yes, hands up. Who has used it? All right, good. So first of all, let me show you how it works. And it's very simple, actually. Um, this is the statue of David. Let's get rid of the cloth and the pedestal here. And let's maybe rotate the guy a bit. And let's add an object which is called Voronoi Fracture. And the cool thing about the Voronoi Fracture, you saw that it's in the MoGraph menu. The Voronoi Fracture is a MoGraph generator, which means that you can control the clones by using effectors, which is awesome. But I show you later why it's awesome. So first of all, let me just make the body a child object of the Voronoi fracture. Maybe in the Voronoi fracture, let's optimize and close holes. And then let's add a rigid body tag. Let's press play. And this is what Voronoi fracturing does. So it will break up objects. And if you, well, if you have a, well, a Voronoi fracturing object in the, MoGraphs, in the MoGraph menu, you would think, well, now I have this, I can break objects, but what else can I do with it? And this is what I want to show you next. Because what you have to understand is the algorithm behind the whole thing. And it's actually very easy to understand. What you see here, um, well, is something that looks quite random. And it is, but not as random as you might think. So let me select the Voronoi Fracture object. And let's go to the Sources tab. And the Sources tab, well, actually, the Sources tab is so important that I really have to zoom in here. The Sources tab, my friends, is, in my opinion, the most important tab here in that object. Because you can use it to control the distribution of fragments. So by default, there is a point generator in here, and it creates 20 points. So it doesn't say it creates fragments. It says it creates points. And this is because of the way the algorithm works. So here you see that the Voronoi fracturing algorithm distributes points randomly inside of the volume of an object. This is what you can see here. But if we bring down the point amount, let's say to 2, I can explain to you exactly how it works. So here we go. We've got a point here, and we've got a point here. You can see that, right? And what happens is that Voronoi fracturing creates a cut exactly in the middle between these two points. That's the whole principle behind it. If we bring the point amount up to three, and maybe let's adjust the seat. 
to something like this. Here you can also see it. Let's adjust the camera angle. Where are we? Here, somewhere here. All right. So we've got this point and we've got this point, and this is the cut in the middle. We've got this point and this point, and this is the cut in the middle, and we've got this point and this point, and this is the cut in the middle. It's still the same principle, and no matter how high you go with the point amount, even if you go to 200, you cannot see that principle anymore, but it's still there. And now the cool thing about Voronoi fracturing is also here in the sources tab that you can use any object as a source. So let's try something. We create a spline from here to there. That's our spline and we want to use that spline as a source in this very important, I cannot stress this enough, in this very important sources tab. Okay, now we've got a spline here and we select it. You see that there are points on the spline and because it's perfectly straight, the points are arranged perfectly straight evenly on that spline, which means that we slice the object. You can see that, right? And now to get um, a little bit further, just to show it to you, um, if we add a random effector, for example, we can randomize all of these fragments. All right, but that's actually not what I wanted to show you. I want to show you how this works. How this works. All right, let's analyze this a bit. So in the beginning, uh, we have just one piece and then it becomes more pieces and then the pieces are randomized. And we will create that. So let's go to Cinema 4D and let's create a cube because many things in Cinema 4D start with a cube and let's make it very flat so we can see the object that we will use for fracturing the whole thing later. So first, let's create a Voronoi fracture object and let's get rid of the default point generator because we don't need it. Instead, we want to create a matrix object. So who has used the matrix object before? Okay, quite a few people. So the matrix object is basically the same as a MoGraph cloner. So it will well, it will not clone objects, but it will create the positions, rotations, and scales for the clones, so to speak. So if we create one of these matrix objects, you will see that there are, well, a lot of cubes in the scene, but if you render this, you will see nothing because those cubes are just representations of the matrices, of the points, and their transformation in 3D space. Okay, now let's bring this down to, let's say, 7 by 1 by 7. And let's scale the matrix up a bit so we can see what happens. All right. Now let's use the matrix as a fracturing source. And again, I cannot make it clear enough, the sources tab is very important. Good. Let's drag and drop it inside of here, and let's also offset the fragments a bit here so we can see better what happens. Okay, what do we have here? We've got the matrices and we created some cuts. And as you can see here, we've got this matrix and this matrix and there's a cut in the middle. We have this matrix and this matrix, there's a cut in the middle, and so on and so forth. Same principle as before. And um, if we scale the matrix object, you can see that also the whole um, yeah, fracturing pattern adjusts, which is awesome. Okay, now let's start animating the whole thing because the cool thing about Voronoi fracturing is that you can animate the sources and create animated patterns with it. So let's create a keyframe for the matrices count here. And let's go a bit more to the beginning and let's bring the count down to one by one by one. 
And now you see that if we press play, bloop, we've got more fragments because we animated the amount of source points. Okay, now you might ask yourself, why did he use a matrix object and not, for example, a plane for distributing the, um, the source points here? And the reason is because the matrix object is a MoGraph generator, which means that I can use MoGraph effectors to adjust the positions of these matrices. Let's do that. Let's create a random effector and bam. This is actually more or less what we had before with the default point generator that distributes points randomly in the object. But with the difference that we can now adjust the strength of randomness and blend from a very geometrical pattern to a very random pattern. So the flickering in the color is because um, the amount of fragments um, adjusts. So maybe let's turn off colorized fragments. And let's instead enable screen space ambient occlusion. Okay, in the random effector, we bring down uh, the randomization of Y position to zero. So now we've got this. Okay. You can see what happens. It's very beautiful. And now we want to animate the randomness here. So let's go to frame, let's say, to frame 60. And in the effector tab, we set a keyframe for the strength. And at frame, let's say, 40, we set another keyframe for the strength, but the, frame, uh, the strength should be zero. So let's play that back. Roop, roop. Awesome, isn't it? And here comes the next thing, which is also quite cool. I showed you before that the randomness can be animated. So let's do that as well. Um, also here in the random tab, or in the effector tab, we adjust the random mode from random to be noise. Awesome! All right, let's bring down the animation speed and let's check indexed and here we go. So let me get rid of the matrix display here. So this is what we just created. And the cool thing is, Oh shit, I'm already overdoing it. How many time do I have left? Minus 10 minutes. Minus 10 minutes. Isn't that great? Um, let me show you one last thing. Um, so, in the Voronoi Fracture object, I can also invert um, the whole shape. And then I've got this. Let's make it a bit bigger. Maybe to two. And if we let me go to this frame here. And if we add this to, let's say, a volume builder and bring down the, um, the, vol uh, the voxel size here and smooth it and bring down the smooth strength to something like this and then mesh the whole thing, we can have something like that. You know, if I had more time, I could make it look more beautiful. But you see where this is going. All right, uh, I think I have to stop now. <laughs> but um, anyway, I ask you to do me a favor. Can I ask you for a favor? That is great, because I have some kind of competition going on with my colleague Glenn, who is the other presenter at Maxon, and he always sends me uh, videos of crowds just, yeah, just, making some noise. Can you do that for me? And I make a video? Yeah. All right, so we will, have, uh, we will make two videos because I want to make him a bit jealous. And um, the first one, um, I just asked you for making some noise and uh, then you just freak out, okay? And not just clapping, really freaking out, okay? All right.
Istanbul, how are you doing? All right, thank you very much. Now the second one, which will be a bit more funny. I will ask you, who do you like more, Glenn or me? <laughs> and then I say, Glenn, and I want one person to stand up and, yay! <laughs> who wants to be that person, you? Okay, so you are gonna be the person standing up and, yay! Okay, and then I say, or do you like me more? And then everyone stands up and freaks out, okay? <laughs> Great. All right. All right, Istanbul, who do you like more, Glenn or me? So who likes Glenn more? Okay, we, we have to do that again, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. Istanbul, who do you like more? Do you like Glenn more or me? Let's make some noise for Glenn. Glenn? All right, or do you like me more? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, let's jump back to the keynote because I've got one last slide for you, which is this one. Thank you very much. So, If you have more questions about the stuff that I showed you, um, please approach me in the breaks and I can show you maybe some more stuff, all right? Cool, so thanks to the translation ladies. Um, because you laughed at the right uh, time, I think um, they did a great job and did not just read uh, child books or so. <laughs> all right, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, bye.